We're going to read through the whole chapter. It's actually only 18 verses, but we're going to read through the chapter, and then we're going to pray, and then we'll see what the Lord has for us, all right? It goes like this. James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we unpack these verses and dig into this chapter, we need your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Well, first of all, Lord, we need hearts that can hear. We need ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that will receive what you want to say to us today. So we ask you to do that work, Lord, in us to kind of just remove any obstacle or barrier for us today, hearing your voice. And we pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us and, and speak, Lord, about the areas of our lives that need to be addressed. You're very good to do that and very faithful. And we pray that you'd help us, Lord, that we might live lives uh, that are a blessing to you and to others. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you look at this chapter, and you, you know, sometimes in your Bibles, they'll actually put headings that are not part of the scripture. They're just headings in the Bible. You'll notice that there are two main headings or two main sections in uh, James chapter 3. And the first is contained in verses 1 through 12. And that's where James talks to us about our words and the power that they can have in our lives. And then the second section, which is much more brief, kind of there toward the end of the chapter, 13 through the end, is all about worldly wisdom uh, as it is kind of seen also in the light of uh, heavenly wisdom. So you got worldly and heavenly wisdom that he's going to talk about. But you'll notice that James begins this chapter with a rather sobering uh, sort of a reminder, I suppose, about anyone who would set their desire to become a teacher in the body of Christ. And it's a warning that involves the level of accountability that goes along with anyone who claims to teach God's word. Because you got to remember, when you teach God's word, you're purporting to speak for God. And that's not a small issue. James says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach, he says, will be judged with greater strictness. And you know, if you've ever, if you've read through the Bible and you've noticed what it says and you believe what it says, 
you're going to know that God takes very seriously this issue of those who represent him and those who misrepresent him. And that's what kind of the whole strictness is all about here. You know, the apostle Peter wrote about the, 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 the prophets of the past who were false, the teachers uh, that are false of the present and even who are to come. Let me put this on the screen for you. From first or second Peter, rather, chapter 2, he says, But false prophets also arose among the people, speaking the, in the nation of Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing, up, look at this, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Look at this last sentence. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. In other words, Peter is saying God's going to have the last word because there's going to be a stricter judgment for those who speak for God, for those who say, well, you know, this, and boy, I tell you something, and, and it's not just teachers. I mean, this, he's talking about teachers here and, and teaching is what I'm doing here right now. You all know what that is, but, but there's even just speaking saying, I, the Lord has a message for you. Whenever we speak for God, whether you're a teacher or whether you have a prophetic gifting or whether you just feel like you have a message from the Lord to somebody, you better know what you're saying is really truly from God. And you better not be messing with people because God does not take it lightly when his people get messed with, particularly from those who are leaders. You guys remember why... Uh, Moses wasn't able to go into the promised land, right? I mean, he's traveled all through the wilderness for 40 years with these people that just constantly got on his nerves. And after 40 years spending time with these people, they went into the wilderness and he didn't, he didn't get to go. And you'll remember that it all centered around this, this, this time. And it was at the conclusion of their wilderness wanderings when the people were once again without good fresh water to drink. And they started to complain. And not just kind of like, man, I wish we had water. They were complaining bitterly and speaking against Moses and speaking against the Lord's faithfulness and all this and that and the other thing. And God basically told Moses to go out, take his staff, and speak to the rock, remember? And, he, and the Lord said, and I'll take care of my people. Water will come out. But you'll, if you remember that story, that's just not what Moses did. He actually got angry. And he vented in front of the people with angry words. And instead of speaking to the rock, you'll remember that Moses struck the rock with his staff. And, you know, God was gracious and water did come out and the people were taken care of and so forth. But, but you'll remember that it was just after that, Moses kind of had to go to the woodshed. And God called him and said, listen, we need to talk. I wasn't angry. You were angry. And I didn't tell you to strike the rock. I told you to speak to the rock. And you misrepresented me. Because you basically told the people, you showed the people, I was angry. I wasn't angry. I was ready to bless. And so that kind of misrepresentation, you know, caused Moses to be denied entrance into the promised land. God takes those kind of matters very seriously when he is misrepresented. And so when a teacher takes seriously the word of God and stays true to the word, we should never respect or, or, or rather expect any kind of, a, of praise for that or any kind of congratulation uh, for that. You don't praise people for not being stupid. Because, you know, veering away from the word of God is really, really dumb in light of what we see throughout the scripture that God takes seriously those who misrepresent him. If you take that seriously, then anybody who teaches the word of God is not going to do that. If they believe the word of God. So what is our attitude supposed to be? Let me show you what Jesus said. 
It's recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 17. He said, you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say this, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. We're not looking for a pat on the back when we've been true to the word of God or when we've shared accurately what the Bible says to somebody. I'm not looking for all kinds of accolades. You're going to find this weird, but I get them. I do get them. I get notes almost every week of people thanking me for staying true to the word. And I'm thinking to myself, this, that's not praiseworthy. It's stupid to go against God, but it's not praiseworthy to go with him. Are you with me? <laughs> it is the duty of the teacher to convey what the word says. Not what he wants to th make it say or what people want it to say or whatever. He is to convey what the word says and no more. There's a remark the apostle Paul made in his letter to the Corinthians. Let me show you this. He says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. Do not go beyond. Let's stay right here. One of, the, one, of the nice, one of the funnest responses that I have to people when they ask me questions, because you got to know about 50% of the questions I get from people about biblical things aren't answered in the Bible. And so I love just to go, well, the Bible doesn't comment on that. And I leave it. I leave it at that. But people sometimes will write me back and say, well, yeah, I know that, but no, 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 no. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going beyond what is written. I'm not going to play those games. That's where you get into trouble is when you go beyond what is written. So any teacher that, I mean, right here, James says, any teacher that goes beyond what is written is going to answer to the Lord himself. And I got to tell you something, I fear God. I'm not terrified of God, but I fear God. Now in verse two, and following, James is going to go on here and speak of just how critical our words actually are. He says here in verse 2 that if any man is able to control his tongue, he'd be a perfect man. Now, we know there is no such thing as a perfect man. He's saying, though, that if he were able to execute perfect self-control as it relates to the words that come out of his mouth, he would be a perfect man. Of course, he goes on to remind us that we all stumble in many ways. And that even though the tongue is a relatively small part of the physical body, it has incredible power over uh, an individual's ultimate destiny. And it does. You can make or break your life with your words. You can, you can get yourself arrested by just what comes out of your mouth. You can get in all kinds of trouble. You can ruin your marriage, and some of you have, with just simply the things that came out of your mouth. Look at the, verse 3 again. It says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole body as well. And, and you know, those of you that worked with horses and you've seen even a bit, it's a small thing in relation to the size of this massive animal. A bit is really a small little apparatus and yet it moves this huge animal to and fro and so forth. And then he talks about a sailing vessel, same thing. He says, you look at ships, they're huge. They're driven also by huge winds. They have these massive sails. And yet the, 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 uh, the captain or, or the uh, whoever pilot, as he refers to him here, directs this massive ship with, with this relatively small rudder. It's it, it, relative to the size of the ship. And so he's, he's basically talking about how a small thing can direct a big thing. He says in verse 5 that um, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And think about how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. You can take a single match, a single match, burn hundreds and thousands of acres of land. Again, he's making the point about your tongue pretty small part of your body can direct your entire life. And so it behooves us to be very careful. What does the Bible say? Quick to listen, slow to speak. Can you imagine if we all followed that one? I, I, I have been quick to speak too many times in my life. 
and it has never served me well. And speaking of fire, (laughs) James goes on to give us some insights into judgment related to the tongue. He says that the tongue is a fire. It, it, It can burn. It says it's a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining, or your Bible may say corrupting or defiling, the whole body setting on fire the entire course of life. And here he says, and the tongue itself is set on fire by hell. Now that's interesting. It's interesting particularly in light of the fact that you'll remember Jesus tells a story. It's recorded for us in the Gospels where he tells a story about this rich man and this poor man. And the poor man was constantly begging for food at the doorstep of the rich man, but the rich man wouldn't give him anything. And ultimately, two, both of the men died, you'll remember. And one went to a place of punishment awaiting judgment, and the other one went to a place of comfort. And by the way, that was not a parable Jesus told. And he goes on and he talks about how the rich man was suffering, particularly related to his tongue. Let me show you this. James chapter 16, and he called out, this is the rich man, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, he says, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Have you ever seen that in the Gospels? His tongue was on fire. That's exactly what James is saying here in this chapter. It's a world of fire, it's a world of unrighteousness, and it itself is set on fire. It's not a fun thing to think about. But the difficulty of controlling our tongue is kind of highlighted in the next few verses. Look at verse 7 and 8. He says, every kind of beast and bird, reptile, sea creature, whatever, they have all can be tamed. In fact, they have been tamed, but no human can tame the tongue. And here's why. He says it's a restless evil and it's full of deadly poison. Jesus is, or James rather is making the point here that the tongue cannot be tamed by human effort. Would you hear me please right now? Because this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say about the tongue. It cannot be tamed by human effort. So if you've been trying to kind of change the way you speak, I want to encourage you that it's a futile effort on your own part to try to do it in your own strength. It's not by human effort that it's going to be changed. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. You got to confess it. You got to confess. If you've got reckless words or even obscene words or hurtful words that come tumbling out of your mouth on a semi-regular basis, you have to confess it to God. Lord, this is me. And I confess that this is, this is awful and this shouldn't be. And I need your help because you know what? I can't change this. I can't change this. That's the smartest thing you'll ever do in your life is admit to God you can't change you. While at the same time confessing that he can change you and that you're willing to let him. He says, no human being can tame the tongue. Try as he may. It remains a restless evil. The New King James says it's an unruly evil. Again, the point here is that the human tongue is capable of great evil and destruction. The book of Proverbs repeats it to us over and over. Let me show you. Uh, With the mouth, his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. 15.4, a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Uh, Proverbs 10, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. And we all, you know, we know these things. And, 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 you know, Proverbs is nothing more than observations of life. Just observations. In our society, we're all too familiar with what we refer to as verbal abuse. We've learned, and we've learned rightly, that words can injure just as deeply and seriously as can fists. And it is especially serious, and I will tell you right now and speak directly to the men of this fellowship, but it is very and especially serious when those hurtful and damaging words come from a man. 
And I'm talking here specifically to husbands and fathers. And the reason I say that is because we, who are husbands and fathers, have been specifically given the task by God to protect our families. And when we are the ones who are actually doing the hurting, who's going to protect them? It's kind of like, you know, when the law enforcement in a particular area becomes corrupt, they're the ones who are given the job of keeping the, the peace and keeping law and order. And if they are literally involved in lawlessness and disorder, who's going to protect? The whole society is going to tumble into chaos. And so it goes also in the home. When a man is reckless with his words and hurtful with the things that he says. And that is why the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church in Colossae. Husbands... Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And the way we are harsh and the way we provoke is by our words. The words that we speak. Now, I want you to be careful, guys, and listen with me. I'm not trying to condemn. There isn't a man alive in this room or anywhere in the world who hasn't foolishly spoken a reckless word to his family. We all have, myself included. You know, I've been married 43 years. You gotta know in that time, I've said some stupid things for which I had to go to my wife and apologize or go to my children and apologize. As James said earlier, we all stumble in many ways, okay? So let's get that out of the way. I'm not saying that if you've ever said something wrong, you know, you're a dirty, rotten dog, you can't be forgiven. And, and so on and so on. I'm not saying that at all. I am talking this morning about the man who regularly and consistently speaks demeaning and cruel words to his family. I'm talking about the man who constantly criticizes, never has a kind or, or, or good word to build up. He is always sarcastic. He is degrading in his speech. James actually goes and then, and then calls himself a Christian. He says, with it, and it means our mouths, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, he says, come blessing and cursing. In other words, we praise the Lord in church. And then on the way home, I berate my wife. He says, my brothers, these things ought not to be. And then he goes on to, in verses 11 and 12 and so forth, he begins to talk about things that are contrary to nature. He starts by talking about a spring of water. He says, is it possible for a spring of water to spring forth both fresh and salt water at the same time? No, it's not possible. It's either going to be a salt water spring or it's going to be a fresh water spring. He talks about trees. He, he says, you know, uh, can a fig tree bear olives? Well, no, of course it can't. Why? Because it is contrary to, uh, to nature. It is unthinkable in the natural world, you know, to go to an apple tree and, and, think, or, and find bananas or pears. I mean, it's, it's, it's unthinkable. Nobody would even do it. It's stupid. And yet we put up with our mouths doing things that are contrary to our life in Christ all the time. It is just as unnatural and just as inappropriate for we who are born again and filled with the Spirit of God to allow words to come out of our mouths that are hurtful or demeaning toward others, even if you don't know the person. Can I show you a sobering reminder by our Lord Jesus Christ from Matthew 12? He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. God's listening. You know, it's a very common thing when you hear or see people get involved in some kind of an emotional row and they, in the heat of that emotion, say something that is hurtful or demeaning or whatever. It, it, it's very common for them to settle down later on and say, oh man, I, I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that, I don't know where those words came from. Jesus has an answer for you. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. 
Well, that'll bust you in the chops, won't it? I mean, like right now. You might not know where it comes from, but God does. It's not a problem with your mouth. This isn't something that washing your mouth out with soap is going to help, as if it ever did. It's a heart problem. It starts in the heart. It emanates from the heart. And I understand this because before I started walking with the Lord, I had a filthy mouth. And I'm ashamed to tell you that, but it's the reality. Before I started walking with Jesus, I had a filthy mouth. And when I got mad, I lost all self-control and would say all manner of obscene, vile things. And I hated it even while it was happening. And I'm so glad that eventually at some point in my life, I realized I didn't have a mouth problem. I had a heart problem. And I had to bring it to Jesus and say, you know what? I am a wicked, vile man. And I can't change this. But you can. So let me just kind of end this section by saying that if you're living with someone who daily demeans you, threatens you, and causes you to live in fear, if you ever, ever think of telling someone, you need to come and talk to us. If that's you, if you live with someone like that, you need to come and tell us. Because it needs to stop, especially, especially if there are children involved. It needs to stop. Now, the final section of this chapter deals with wisdom, both worldly and godly. James says in verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness, or your Bible may say gentleness of wisdom. So we've been dealing with wisdom as it is conveyed or expressed through our words. And now James is going to kind of turn a little bit and he's going to talk about wisdom or the lack of wisdom or worldly wisdom as it is kind of conveyed or even contradicted through uh, our actions and attitudes. He begins with the contradiction of wisdom. He says in verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy, what is bitter jealousy? Well, in a, in a short version, it means that I want something that you have and I'm mad that you have it and I don't. That's bitter jealousy. He says, or if you have selfish ambition in your hearts, what is selfish ambition? Those are aspirations and goals that are all about me. Can I just stop you for a moment here and tell you that we actually program our kids to be selfishly ambitious. We do. When we talk to our children when they're getting ready to like going through their high school years and we're, we're talking about college and stuff like that, do we talk to them about what they're going to go out and do in the world for the greater good or for other people? No, we talk about how to get a good education so they'll make good money and be able to live comfortably when they retire one day. That's selfish. That's selfish ambition. What parents ought to be saying to their kids is, why has God put you on this planet? Why did God put you here? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what role he has you to play in the kingdom of God. Maybe you should adjust your college or your plans for the future based on where God wants you to be and not just how much money you want in your bank account. We teach our kids to be selfishly ambitious. So he says, if you've got selfish ambition, again, self-directed concerns for the future and your own goals. He says, do not boast or be false to the truth. In other words, don't deny it. Don't think that it's normal Christian behavior because it's not. We're not, we're not put on this world to live for ourselves. We're here to follow the example of Jesus Christ who said, I am among you as one who serves. Remember that? That's what Jesus said at the last supper. I am among you as one who serves. He proved it by on, on the very night that he was betrayed by taking off his outer garment, wrapping it around his waist and washing the feet of the disciples, including Judas Iscariot. He washed Judas's feet too, you know. 
That was before he dismissed him to go betray, do the betrayal. That's the example that we've been given, how to live our lives. Remember what Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. That's our model. So don't be selfishly ambitious and don't pretend like it isn't, you know, it's just the most normal thing in the world. What does he say in verse 15? You know what selfish ambition is? He says, that's not the wisdom that comes down from above. That's earthly. You and I would say worldly. It's worldly wisdom, right? He, he goes on to say, it's very unspiritual to be completely focused on myself and how much money I'm going to make and the things I'm going to buy and where I'm going to go and how I'm going to make myself happy. That's just, that's the way the world thinks. It's earthly. It's unspiritual. In fact, he says, it is even demonic. Now, there's a strong word for you. But by calling it demonic, James is basically saying that it reflects the influence of Satan, not God. You guys do know that the whole world is under the control of the enemy, right? The world, the world, the system of mankind is under the control of the evil one right now. That's what the Bible tells us. I'm not making that up. And so there are philosophies and emphases and ideologies and goals and plans and desires that are very worldly. And there are all those things that are godly. And that is what James is talking to us about here, the difference between the two. See, the problem, you know, when we're, especially when we're raising kids or even trying to think through this stuff on our own, it's that these things like jealousy and selfish ambition, this is the fuel the world runs on. This is what, they're, this is what makes them get up in the morning. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. The world runs on these things. And we're affected by them. We're, we are very much affected by them. And, we, and you can't deny it. The world even promotes it. You know? But there's a huge downside. Look at verse 16. This is where he gives us the consequences of living a life full of jealousy and selfish ambition. He says, for where those things exist, jealousy and selfish ambition, there will be disorder, lack of order, and every vile practice. Let me ask you something. Do you see any jealousy or selfish ambition in modern American politics? I know you all laugh. Me too. Me too. Do you see it in your own home? Yeah. Yeah, I do. We can easily and even kind of chuckle when we admit that it lives in the political world. It's a little bit Dis uncomfortable to admit that it's actually in our home, in my heart. But you know, I can pray all day for politicians and look really spiritual. <laughs> oh God, I pray for those rotten politicians, full of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Lord, you know, but what am I going to do when I see those things in my home? Well, I'm not going to pray about it before. First thing I'm going to do is repent. And then I'll give it to the Lord. But first I got to repent. I got to turn away from it. I got to recognize it as even an issue. And then turn to the Lord for forgiveness and the power to change. Finally, you'll notice that James in verse 17 and 18 ends by defining the kind of wisdom that comes from God. And now we're going to talk about what it produces. He says, but the wisdom from above is fear, uh, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest comes from these things. He says it's a harvest of righteousness that is sown in peace by those who make peace. So you can see here that both worldly wisdom and godly wisdom have their own fruit. And on, on, on the one side, the fruit is disorder and every vile practice. And on the other side, the fruit is uh, good. But what's crazy about the, the, the fruit of worldly wisdom is how quickly we become accustomed to it and even familiar with it. Even though it produces disorder, it produces moral confusion. We're just, 
we, we grow up with it, you know? Kids today are just, are, they're, you know, it's funny, I've got grandkids and it's amazing. You know, I, I, my two-year-old grandkids, you know, when they're like two, they, they flip through a computer on a tablet or something like that, like they were born for it. Have you ever noticed that? And then, and my dad who's 94 can't hit the right button and is constantly, oh, it just went away and I can't, and because he wasn't raised with it. But you know what? We see the same sort of a thing when it comes to morality. The kids today are just being raised among moral confusion and they've become accustomed to it. It's no big deal. It's just what it is. Guy doesn't know whether he's a, a male or a female or maybe he identifies as something else. Well, yeah, of course, whatever. And for those of us who are a little bit older and sporting some gray hair, we're kind of like, are you joking? That's confusion. But not to some people it isn't. We become very, very acclimated. We just learn to live with confusion. You live in confusion for long enough and you just learn to live with it. And there's a great deal of the wisdom of this world that believers operate under it and don't even stop to question it. Don't even stop to think about it. Seeps into every aspect of our lives, seeps into our marriages, our homes, our businesses, our finances, our words, our thoughts, our plans, our goals. But on the other side, where there is godly wisdom, look again what James says you'll find. You find purity. Purity, that's wholesomeness. That's healthy relationships, healthy business practices, healthy habits. He says you find peace. The world thinks you find peace by sitting in the lotus position and humming. You find peace by walking after godly wisdom. He says also, here's another interesting thing that you get from godly wisdom. You find that there's an openness to reason. The world is increasingly unreasonable. Unreasonable, unwilling to reason. We are very emotional today. We call it science, but it's emotion. And we are not open to reason because and I'm talking about as a world, but, but, but godly wisdom is open to reason. He says, there you will also find mercy. Isn't that interesting? You find mercy where there's godly wisdom, where there's worldly wisdom, you're going to find the opposite. You're going to find an unmerciful spirit. You know why? Do you know why mercy emanates from godly wisdom? It's because godly wisdom tells me that I'm just as bad as everybody else. That's what it tells me. That's what the Bible tells me. That my heart is just like everybody else's heart. I'm no better than anybody else. And so you see, that changes my whole perspective about how I look at other people. I look with mercy now because I know exactly the way you're made. You're made just like me with all the faults and wrinkles and warts. He says that it's also... The outgrowth is also sincerity from godly wisdom. And can I just tell you, this is where godly wisdom comes from right here, right here. That's where you're going to gain that godly wisdom. Be influenced by the word and not the world. Therein is godly wisdom. Amen. Let's stand together. Do you feel like you just got spanked? <laughs> well, then we must have gone through the book of James because that's what the book of James does for us. You kind of end up kind of going, ow, you know, kind of rubbing your backside. That hurt. Well, so be it. If you need prayer this morning, come on down front. We'd love to pray with you. Father, thank you so much for our time together uh, this morning in the word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for making that word come alive. Thank you for teaching us, instructing us, guiding us, directing us through the scriptures. And we just pray, Father, that you'd continue to speak to us. 
about what's right and true and good, and that the wisdom from above would touch our hearts and illuminate our minds and that we would begin to see these positive elements from the wisdom of your word coming forth in our life. Be with us, we pray, Father, in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said together, amen.